<laughs> okay, we are live now. <laughs> okay, so hello again. I guess that's that works as an intro. Hey again. Hi, miserable listeners. I, I don't fucking know. You guys got to <laughs> bail me out here. So um, you're listening to the third episode of Misery Tourism's Misery Movies podcast. Uh, in this episode, we're going to be discussing the film Hard Candy. Um, we have our usual contributors back with us today. Um, I'm William. With us, we have Sarah. Hey, guys. Rudy. Yo. Yo. Uh, and AJ. <laughs> hey. Hello, AJ. So, um, so I, we have to do something right off the bat here. As in previous episodes, this podcast is going to include a spoiler-free version, a spoiler-free segment, I suppose. The first half an hour or so of the podcast will be a spoiler-free review of the film, uh, along with a just a general thematic discussion of the film, what we liked and disliked about it. And the second half will be a more spoiler-rich portion where we really dig into the nuances of the film, talk about specific scenes, talk about... Um, you know, talk about the film in a more detailed way. That's what we've been doing in the last two podcasts, and that's what we'll be doing in this one. But a caveat here. Uh, there is something that happens about 10, 15 minutes into this movie that could probably be considered a pretty significant twist. It is impossible to talk about this movie without – discussing that twist. It's so the spoiler free version will include discussions about that thing that happens about 10, 15 minutes into the movie. If you now it's not a huge spoiler. I can't imagine how you would even know this movie existed without knowing that twist. It's basically on the movie poster. It's on most of the promotional materials for the the movie. I think if you look it up on Rotten Tomatoes, it will probably reveal this. Uh, it's basically the premise of the film. But if you want to go into the film completely unspoiled, completely uncontaminated, I recommend you stop now and watch the movie now because uh, there'll be monsters from here on out. There'll be spoilers <laughs> from here on out. From this point <laughs> forward, there will be one part of the film will be spoiled for you. So Check out now if you don't want to be spoiled, okay? I'm going to give you five seconds as a listener to check <laughs> out, and then, and then you, you know, no holds barred after at that point. So five, four, three, two, one. All right. Everyone okay. dies. Yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> so, Okay. So let's uh, let's get started with our discussion of the movie. AJ, this film was your choice, so mm -hmm. I guess I'm going to let you give a little synopsis of give, give you know give us the nuts and bolts of the movie. I'm looking forward to this discussion actually because <laughs> uh, there was something a little circle jerkish about our fir first two podcasts. Not that I'm not happy with them. I think we had a really interesting in-depth discussion, but there was a lot of agreement about the first two movies in that we all kind of felt like Careful was a really interesting experiment that maybe didn't wasn't super engaging, didn't work in every possible way, aesthetically appealing, uh, and that we all thought The Redemption of General Butt Naked was a really fascinating documentary. I think there's going to be a lot of disagreement about the quality of this movie in this podcast, so I'm anxious to get into that. But before we do, AJ, can you, you know, get us started here? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I know you'll definitely have a lot to say about it. <laughs> but um, basically the premise of the movie is that um, there's two main characters, really. They're mostly the only characters that you really care about. Um, there's Haley and who is a 14-year-old girl, and Jeff, who is a middle-aged man, somewhat. Um, you know, early middle-aged. Mid, <laughs> maybe early 30s, late 20s, somewhere around there. 
No, he's got to be. He has got to be at least in his mid thirties, right? Yeah, I mean, you know, somewhere around there. How old is the actor? Uh, I think he's in his forties now. Yeah, mm-hmm. and this is movie's about ten years old, so mm-hmm. yeah. don't make don't make me Wikipedia sh- this shit. Anyway, AJ, you can continue. <laughs> but um, they meet online and uh, are you know they they go to meet up in real life at a coffee shop and then um jeff takes Haley back to his house and uh oh you know, <laughs> <laughs> the, the twist is coming um as rudy always says if feds was listening uh, <laughs> or as cameron initially said if feds was listening <laughs> so um they end up you know uh, drinking and then one of them ends up drugged. Well, of them, I think we I think we can say which one because that's the pre- it's not who yeah, you'd expect. It's, it's not who you'd expect. <laughs> it's Jeff ends up drugged and wakes up, you know, tied up and um Haley proceeds to I think you could fairly say t- try to torture him, basically. I think she does more than try. I mean, I, I think she tortures him, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so any, anything else we should say about, you know, the premise? No, I think that it, that is the premise, that uh, this apparent pedophile takes his 14-year-old girl home with him, <laughs> and you think, uh-oh, and <laughs> sure enough, it gets bad from there, but it doesn't get bad for the character you'd expect it to get bad for. Um <laughs> Yeah, and I think that is that's the basic premise of the movie. Patrick Wilson, by the way, is forty three years old now. So ten years ago, when the film was released, he would have been he would have been my age. So <laughs> <laughs> like eighteen. So um, anything, anyone. So AJ, let's start with this. Why did you pick this movie? One of the reasons I picked it was because I felt like it would lead to pretty good discussion. Um, I thought there would probably be polarizing opinions on how good it is. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's also, it it kind of fits in with the um, misery tourism subject somewhat of, you know, we haven't encountered pedophilia yet so why not nope. right mm-hmm. and it's yep. a movie that i i personally really enjoy so you know yeah. why not be able to make everyone watch it <laughs> yes subject everyone to it exactly. so um i guess we can talk now about our general impressions of the film i don't want to lead for a couple of reasons. Um, first of all, I, in the past couple of podcasts, I have I probably talked for out of the hour and fifteen minutes, forty five minutes of both of any given podcast was probably me talking and you guys. So I want to kind of shift the balance here and get, have it less, you know, dominate the conversation less. Uh, secondly, I don't want – I know how I felt about this film, but I, <laughs> I, I don't want to contaminate um, contaminate your opinions with my opinion. So maybe we can go around and uh, just quickly uh, talk about our impressions of the film in a generally spoiler-free way. Now that we've gotten on the table or off the table, we, well, now that we've <laughs> broached the subject of – you know, the twist, which is that he ends up drugged and tortured. Uh, I think that uh, we can talk about this the movie in more general terms. So anyone want to get, get us started here? No. No? Well, what the <laughs> hell? Who wants to, who wants to fucking yeah. talk here? Well, I'll start since I okay. have not a lot to say about it. <laughs> um, That's a good sign. <laughs> <laughs> but I think what I have to say is choice for some choice. viewers. 
who might be on the fence as to whether or not to watch it. <laughs> okay, um, well then, perfect. Go ahead. <laughs> um, so I'm not sure if this is supposed to be an exploitation movie or not. <laughs> uh, but and this is... Sorry, Go ahead. No. Go ahead. I was going to just going to say when you say exploitation film, what do you mean exactly? Uh, just for reference, as far as you know, dropping some movie names, I'll say like Boss Nigger or Rape Squad or something like that. <laughs> or you know, like one of those horror movies that uh, I can't think of any names honestly. Right. I... <laughs> one of those haunted horror movies, you know, with a. Uh, you know, Robert England cameo or some shit that's on the horror movie channel. Right. Um, I don't know. Like I said, I don't know if it's supposed to be an exploitation movie or not. I don't really care, but I most definitely watched this as an exploitation movie and I enjoyed <laughs> it that way. Um, I think the acting is pretty good. Uh, Ellen Page and uh, Patrick Wilson do a good job of uh, conveying their characters emotionally I think um, the script I don't I mean <laughs> as far as exploitation goes I mean it, it, it did the job for me <laughs> that's a low bar to clear and um like I don't know I guess it's not as as far as exploitation movies go, and I'll keep pretending this is an exploitation movie. <laughs> right. It is, um, it's not like a particularly cerebral exploit. Well, it, I guess it might. <laughs> I don't. I don't I, like, compared to Rape Squad, I mean, I well, guess. I'll compare it, compared to something like uh, like a horror, a more a one that leans more towards the horror, like oh, maybe okay. like Cube or something like that. Oh, yeah. Right, or or maybe like something like Sweet Sweetback's badass song. Yeah, there's a very clear element of social commentary going on there. Right, and that's the social... so it, there's a yeah. where there might be a richer vein of social commentary than appears on the surface. Right, right. I mean, the social commentary here is pretty muddled. I thought <laughs> <laughs> it's present. Yeah, <laughs> but, but as an exploitation movie with Ellen Page. Um, you know, looking cool and the guy being creepy and, you know, yeah, I mean, it, it worked for me. It did the job for me. So if you're, <laughs> if you looked at the Wikipedia for this and thought, you know, well, I'm, I got a Friday night to kill or whatever. And I want, um, I want to hit that exploitation fix <laughs> and you see the keywords of male sexual predator and, <laughs> 14 year old vigilante. I mean, those were key words for me. Um, triggers, if you will. <laughs> so if you see that and think, well, oh, this could really go either way, I'd give it a chance, honestly. I mean, based on that. I mean, honestly, <laughs> the poster, when I saw the poster, I, I figured I would probably like it, just based <laughs> on the Red Riding Hood thing and the. <laughs> but. Yeah, I I liked it more than I expected to. I, you know, this was this was the high point of my Friday Saturday night, I think. And I played yeah. a lot of Overwatch that Saturday, so <laughs> <laughs> that that was good. That's basically all I have to say about that. Okay. Do you wanna do you wanna rate it, Rudy? Oh, are we rating it now? Um, we could. Um, uh, no. Let's circle. Uh, let's yeah. go. Let's go to yeah. everyone and then circle back for the ratings. Mm -hmm. I think. So, Sarah, did you have any general impressions of the film? You had seen it before, so this was your second time watching it. I had, and the first time I saw it, I guess, was uh, about ten years ago, around the time it came out. And mm. at the time, I was about Haley's age, so. <clears throat> yeah. I absolutely loved it the first time that I saw it. I thought she was totally badass, but I should also <laughs> point out that I love like psychologically disturbed characters. Mm -hmm. um, and this this movie really made me love Ellen Page as an actress. Yeah, I think that's something we can all agree on. Uh, it, is that Ellen Page's performance is quite good here. Um, 
Yeah, absolutely. And that Ellen Page is a talented actress. Did you were you saying something, Sarah, or did I you we lost you, maybe? Uh oh. Seems like we lost her. Uh -oh. We lost her. That's okay. Um yeah. We'll just cut this out of the audio version. <laughs> if you're watching this on YouTube, I oh fuck you, you're gonna have to wait. <laughs> 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 uh, um yeah. <laughs> if you're expecting something, buddy. <laughs> um, I don't know. Look, Wait, it's my cat. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Oh, shit. Well, I probably shouldn't have said Mr. Bones's name. Uh oh, you just doxed Mr. Bones. Doxed Mr. Bones. <laughs> what yeah. the hell, Goody? Damn, he got doxed. <laughs> Triggered hard. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. But Sarah's uh, working on it. Yes, Mr. Bones, yes. You got doxed, I'm sorry. Doxed. <laughs> D-O-X-ed. Mm -hmm. Not D-M-X. <laughs> Not DMX, no. Uh, Man, Mr. Bones is big, holy shit. He is a big cat. Hey, hey, stop hitting my TV, big cat. <laughs> the TV's like, oh. Yeah. <laughs> wow, he's so big, wow. He, he's fucking huge. God, he's he? like a dog. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like a small dog. Yeah. He's bigger than Nikki, probably. <laughs> oh, yeah, he's much bigger than Nikki. Now you just doxed my mom's dog. I mean, what the <laughs> fuck? <laughs> oh, Jesus. I hope Mr. Bones ends up as the thumbnail. Uh, <laughs> well, yeah, that's the, that's the he thumbnail. disagrees. I am really sorry that for any, like, if anyone's watching this, I am just profoundly sorry. <laughs> <laughs> just go listen to the podcast why what are you doing here you're not gonna we're not gonna do anything you're not gonna see anything here you're gonna see the cat probably five or six more times and that's it <laughs> i'm gonna get a new i'm gonna refill my glass of water yeah maybe there's an audience for seeing the cat five or six more times okay. probably i, I mean it, honestly we may get a better um we may get more views than any of our previous podcasts just by the <laughs> promise of there being a cat in the video mm -hmm. oh. so um Oh, you know what, Rudy? I forgot to ask you this before we started recording. But have you decided what your movie is going to be for next time? Because usually I announce it at the end of the podcast. Uh, yeah. Cool. I'll I'll link it later. Okay. I mean, the name's not going to make any sense anyway. Anyway, so okay. I don't, I don't know. So is it is it hella obscure? It's that one I showed you. Oh, it is the doc. Yeah. Yep. Oh God, man! Of all the, you had so, <laughs> so you had so many good ideas, and you picked the most. Oh God, I don't want to watch that again. Yeah. <laughs> Is it that one? No, it it's it's a, some really obscure documentary about indie game design. Good. Prepare for battle. <laughs> because I'd probably have to sit out if it was the other one. What Which was one? the other one? <laughs> the Fighters? Samuel Delaney one. Oh, oh yeah. Oh, AJ, don't be a homophobe. <laughs> yeah, really. They fought for their rights and stuff. It's not yeah. like there were any graphic depictions of, you know... There were graphic else. descriptions. Of <laughs> descriptions, but not, <laughs> but not depictions. Not depictions that I know of. Uh, yeah, no, I don't. I don't think there were any. <laughs> Man, <laughs> Samuel Delaney, though. 
I wish I were home. <laughs> we can't edit this either, can we? No, we can't. We can't. <laughs> <Nope>. <laughs> so, Rudy, what's the name of that movie, just so I can say it at the end of the podcast? Uh, I think it's called Into the Night is the documentary series, and uh, it's just Into the Night with Jason Rohr and uh, what's his name? Uh other guy. <laughs> other guy. Well, maybe I'll have you. Uh, I'll have you say it at the end of the podcast, then. Chris Crawford. Is Chris the guy Crawford. Okay. Into the night with Jason Rohr and Chris Crawford. <laughs> it's not a feature-length documentary. It's a. Uh, Oh, oh, wait. There's Can you hear me? Okay. I, I okay. had to completely switch computers and headphones. I don't know why that stopped huh. working, but I couldn't get it back on. So. Huh. Yeah. Is anyone hearing anything being fed back now? We have to be careful because... Yeah. No. I'm not. No? I don't hear anything on my end. Okay. Yeah, same here. Okay. So we should be okay. Good to go. Okay. Um... <laughs> <laughs> we have to start all over now. Where did we leave off? I was saying Ellen Page was a good actress. Right. <laughs> uh, so just for those of you listening to this on the podcast, we just experienced some audio issues. Uh, so I'm going to edit that section out. But we're picking up again uh, with Sarah speaking about what... Um, about her response to the fi her feelings about the film. Right. So, again, this was the movie that really made me admire Ellen Page as an actress, the first one. But um, what was I going to say? No, I, I completely loved this movie the first time I saw it. So when AJ uh, recommended it a few weeks ago for the podcast, I got really excited because it, I hadn't seen it since. And you know how when you love a movie when you're younger, mm -hmm. you don't know if you're going to love it when you're older. Right, uh, right. But I actually, I don't, the first time you watch a movie is always the best, I think. Mm -hmm. But I still mm -hmm. loved it, to be honest. I really did. And I don't <laughs> really see it as an exploitation film. Um, I guess for me as a female, <laughs> I, it was more of a girl power movie in a very weird, creepy way. And I really want to get into spoilers, but I can't, so I'll probably stop there. Okay. Um, AJ? Um, yeah, sure. So, personally, I really enjoy this film. I watched it before as well, so this was my second time watching it, and there's something that I really appreciate about the aesthetics. It's, you know, the colors are really interesting, but it's also a very clean movie in terms of like how the setting looks and even with even with some of the things that go on later, spoilers there. It's it's mm -hmm. always very clean and that kind of provokes a sort of emotional response that combines with the fact that you know I'm I'm personal to um, you know yeah it's damaged but more like uh, precocious characters probably precocious <laughs> kids yeah kids yeah uh, you're right about the aesthetics I mean this is a very I guess you'd say antiseptic looking film mm -hmm. uh, in that it is the his house which is basically the only set in the movie is hyper modern looking mm -hmm. you've got a lot of sharp angles you've got a light a lot of very like very it's i don't know how to describe it but modern almost. yeah very 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 mm -hmm. pristine very artistically mm -hmm. arranged um and also very overtly artificial in its appearance right mm -hmm. it doesn't yeah. his house does not look lived in at all it does right. it does look like the house of a photographer 
uh, if that guy had arranged it to look more like a studio than a home. You know, it, it's if it was more about the pretensions of the appearance of the house and it functioning as a house. Mr. Bones, you're going out of control. Another thing I like about the film is the fact that it is um, somewhat open to interpretation of you can watch it a couple different ways. Um, mm -hmm. It definitely seems like both a feminist movie and an exploitation film at the same time. Um, and I kind of like both of those and the fact that it exists in that same sort of space um, is something that I appreciate. Mm -hmm. There is a short, sort of ink blot quality to this film, I think, where it, it, it's highly open to interpretation. Mm -hmm. Which could be seen as a downfall, but can also be seen as something to be appreciated. Uh -huh. So, um, did you have anything, any other initial thoughts on the movie? That's about it for right now. Yeah, so I didn't like this movie at all. I thought this was a pretty <laughs> bad film. <laughs> I, I had tr I'm sorry. <laughs> I, um... I agree with what you just said, AJ, in theory. Um, and I think, but I think in practice, the movie falls short in a lot of, a lot of ways. Like, I love the idea that there, it, I've said a lot of times, I love ambiguity in films. I love it when a film forces you to do the heavy lifting, forces you to figure out what you feel about the subject matter. However, there's a right way to do this and there's a wrong way to do this. The right way to do it um, in a film is to, is to kind of, you need to get the, you need to do a lot of, okay, so it's good that the audience leaves your film not knowing exactly what to think or feel about your subject matter. It's good if you leave them with a lot of questions, with a lot of things to consider afterwards. But your film still has to do the actual honest to goodness heavy lifting. It still has, you still have to have some ideas about the subject matter, right? And you still need <laughs> to present those ideas. And, you, and it's, it, it, it's really fantastic if you can look at something from multiple perspectives and really flesh out all of those perspectives. And the greatest novelists, this is what the greatest novelists do, right? This is what Dostoevsky does, for example. Like Dostoevsky himself, you know, he's a, he's a completely, he, well, he converts to Russian Orthodoxy, right? And from his perspective, when he's writing his novels, I think they are, they're conservative in the sense that they're socially conservative. Uh, and they are Christian in the sense that they are uh, supposed to be in almost a, a almost an act of, of Christian apologism, right? Almost a sort of um, an explanation where, of how you can find faith. Yes, but take something like the brothers Karamazov, right? Where one of the brothers, Alusha, or I'm not sure how to pronounce it, functions as basically the proxy for Dostoevsky's faith. But his brother Ivan, who's this nihilistic atheist character is equally fleshed out. And everything, you you know, characters engage in long monologues, they explain themselves, they explain what they believe in detail. It's all, it's all very well conceived. It's all very well considered. And you feel like, oh, this author just gave two characters, or in the case of the brothers Karamazov, it's, it's many more characters than that, but just gave multiple characters with totally divergent viewpoints an opportunity to express themselves. And I'm not sure what to believe because they all made pretty compelling cases. And boy, isn't the world complex and difficult to understand. The w wrong way to do this is to just make everything, is, is to not give, to say, oh, everything's ambiguous. I'm not really gonna give you any information. 
And I feel like that's what this movie does. I feel like both of the characters in this movie are very thinly drawn. And I think if you were sitting with the screenwriter, he would say, well, these characters are thinly drawn because they're supposed to be mysterious. You're not really supposed to know what motivates them because this is a kind of, of uh, you know, that evil in this world is kind of a, it's an enigma. What makes someone evil? Why, why is it, what drives someone to pedophilia? How could we know? But honestly, at least speculate. <laughs> at least take some time to the more you flesh these characters out you can really you can really dig deep into these characters without picking a side or without um forcing the, the spoon feeding something to the audience in fact what i feel happens here is the worst of both worlds where both of the characters are really thinly drawn they we're kept at a distance from them um and on top of that the, the little bits that you get are basically like pedophilia is bad, which I mean, okay, it is, but that doesn't really <laughs> rise above the level of like an episode of Law and Order SVU. In fact, an episode of SVU would probably put a little more work into trying to offer something about the psychology of its antagonist. Um, but this doesn't, this doesn't do that. Patrick Wilson's character is totally a peg right he's totally he's an absolute blank slate and i feel like patrick wilson is an incredibly talented actor by the way who did a fantastic job i think just last year in fargo which uh, not the not the coen brothers movie but the fx series based on the coen brothers movie um and in that he showed a very broad range which i imagine he still had 10 years ago but in this film he's not really allowed to do be much except inscrutable and Ellen Page, who gives a fantastic performance, really does a lot with a pretty ridiculous character, a character that is basically like precocious teenage Hannibal Lecter, <laughs> right? Uh, and I don't know. I thought it was a pretty dumb movie, guys. I really did. <laughs> I really, really did. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I know that I know that a couple of, I know that two of you really love this movie and that one of you seems to have enjoyed watching it on the couch in his underwear or whatever but I <laughs> I, I could I I couldn't I I did not like this movie. Um the okay, I'm not going to I'm not going to belabor this too much. The other thing that drove me fucking nuts though was the dialogue. I hated the dialogue in this movie. This is, <laughs> all the like I think all, especially all the like eye rolling lines that uh, Ellen Page has. I actually can't recite any of them because the ones that are coming to mind would be spoilers. But there are a lot of moments where it's like, once again, I it's like this faux Hannibal Lecter dialogue where you can imagine her like smacking her lips and sneering. <laughs> and and I, it's like, oh, come on. It, it It's exactly what dialogue shouldn't be. It offers no insight to the character. It's stupid. And it, it's a lot stupider than it thinks it is. It's one thing to have dialogue that's just very blasé and like, I am going to the refrigerator to get a glass of water now. That's bad dialogue. But you could actually get be worse than that if you think you're writing good dialogue, but you're actually writing really, really like atrocious <laughs> dialogue. And that was my perception of the dialogue in this film. I thought it was it was it was more painful than some of the torture that occurs. It was the most painful <laughs> form of torture that I had been there while watching this. So that said, um, <laughs> do you guys want to jump in and say anything? Anything else? Um, I disagree with you. Oh. <laughs> I disagree with you so much. Uh, I, I, to be honest, I, I understand what you're saying about the dialogue and um, characters being at a distance I, they're not that fleshed out that's true i i feel like though for this particular concept it works for me personally at least mm -hmm. um it's i think it's supposed to be a bare bones movie you have this teenage girl you know barely past puberty who very purposefully very suddenly comes into this guy's life and just as quickly leaves it and mm -hmm. you can you can guess her motivations they do leave it open somewhat because she never just comes out and says exactly what led up to this 
I always had this idea myself of why and how she came mm-hmm. across him, you know, why she targeted him. Mm-hmm. I, sometimes it drives me nuts when I watch movies and they don't just tell you what's happening and why. But in this particular instance, I actually enjoyed that. Right. Mm-hmm. I, I mean, my objection isn't so much that there's anything missing from the plot or from characters' explicit mm-hmm. X, Y, Z motivations. Like, and I, I don't want to. I don't want to get too much into this because things are revealed, maybe about both characters' past that I think are offered as by the screenwriter as explanations for their behaviors. Or, uh, but what I'm talking about more is like, like. The three-dimensional depth of human behavior or human motivation. Like I felt like the motivations that were offered were very screenwritery, not very like mm-hmm. fleshed out in a in a way. Were very like pat, and uh, I don't feel like it was like oh well they just left a whole bunch of questions here. I think it was more like you never truly believed in these characters as human beings and every opportunity they had to give the characters some nuance or complexity the they opted instead to either not do that maybe in the hopes of keeping things mysterious or to tap attack on another like pseudo plot twist instead or to have Ellen Page like like steeple her fingers and say another piece of unbearable like <laughs> dialogue and, and I, I don't know and I so I don't I don't know but I, I mean I I suppose yeah I, I do I did like I do generally like these kinds of movies by the way I I love um, uh, I love these very enclosed claustrophobic films where it's like we're going to take just two characters or three characters or whatever, four characters, and we're going to watch them interact with each other, and we're going to keep ramping up the tension. We're going to keep finding new spins and and, um, approaches to understanding these characters. I I generally – that's generally like catnip for me, but in this instance, I don't know. It didn't work for me personally. I know, AJ, I, maybe you want to jump in and defend the film as well. I imagine you do. <laughs> I feel like one of the things that I really like about it is the absurdity of Alan Page's mm-hmm. character. That's something that, like, not only isn't, like, a turnoff on the film, but it's something that draws me to it quite a bit. Exactly. Um, yeah. It's it's the fact that she is basically Hannibal Lecter <laughs> in <laughs> a 14-year-old character. Mm. And that's something that she doesn't have to be a real character <laughs> because of that. And that's kind of, um, if you're talking about abstraction, that's the highest level. Um, it's It's just, you know, one level of character but it's an appealing one Mm -hmm. in a lot of ways so I think that that is I think that's definitely a plus that the movie has and honestly it can be seen as a gimmick which lends to the exploitation interpretation of it Mm -hmm. but you know sometimes gimmicks are fun I agree they can be um but let me uh, this this may seem like it's a complete aside but can i get everyone's opinion of josh whedon very quickly <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh. <laughs> is this directed at me because I- <laughs> <laughs> I'm actually just going to say something about Joss Whedon. Sure, well, just take it away, Rudy. Are, are we reviewing it yet? I mean, uh, can we give yeah, our... Yeah, sure. Like... Yeah, you can. Absolutely. Take your vultures. All right. <laughs> All right. So, um... I don't know, man. Like... <laughs> um... So, a couple of things were said... Uh, some words were said that I thought were cool. Um... I think I heard from Sarah, uh, like feminist 
girl power thing or something. <laughs> and I heard from Hank bad dialogue. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that's <scares> fair. <laughs> um so yeah, I mean <clears throat> those two things like to me this seemed a little bit like comic booky almost like the mm-hmm. in the way the dialogue was delivered and portrayed and I don't think that's really a bad thing. That's a good point. And uh I I don't know like but not like a comic book from today or like a you know one of those sophisto comic books but some real like you know <sighs> I don't want to say trash, but something <laughs> from, you know, something from like the Dark Ages period of comic books, you know, like where you had the serial killer Batman or whatever and slicing people up and that kind of, you know, like a one liner delivered there. And I really, I just like that. That really gets me, um, that gets me in, in the zone, I guess. I don't know. That. <laughs> and uh, so uh, to give my review, I would give this movie probably like 4.5 fireflies out of (laughs) 5. I don't know. I mean, Joss Whedon, I I know Joss Whedon was brought up here, and that was probably like an attack on me, basically. (laughs) No, it was was actually an attack on Rudy, Rudy, it was not an attack on you. It was an attack on It was not an attack on you. It was a, an attack on you and AJ, and possibly Sarah, if she's a fan of Josh Whedon as well. Honestly, I'm not gonna lie. I'm not. I'm not a huge fan of Joss Whedon. I like Firefly a lot, probably more than I should, for reasons that I don't really one. understand. It is. I, oh fucking yeah. hey. <laughs> I love Buffy. Come on. Well, there we Buffy. go. I haven't, yes. I haven't seen Buffy yet. But. It's the Josh Wheaton divide right here. That 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 yeah. says it all. I'm glad I brought that up because this this uh, his his films and his shows from what little I've seen give me roughly the same feeling that I had when I was watching this, which is like <laughs> this is so contrived and. You can hear the writer scribbling like one contrivance after another in order to cover up how shallow like everything that's going on is. And I, I I'm I'm glad that that Josh Whedon has brought joy to your lives, but he's given oh. me nothing but like agony and pain. But now wait a minute though. Um, you asked me what I thought about Josh Whedon. I <laughs> I really don't like Josh Whedon like the person <laughs> but like his work especially firefly is really entertaining to me and honestly like if joss whedon like if i were like you know like kim young il or something or kim <laughs> young un i guess it is i would i would have joss whedon captured and i would have him uh maybe tortured but the point is he would still he would still produce his work to entertain me. And that's the kind of relationship I have with Joss Whedon. <laughs> like, I don't, don't really think much of him like himself, like like mm. the person Joss Whedon, but his work, some of it is really just entertaining for reasons I don't really understand, like I said. Well, I certainly can't give you insight into what makes this work entertaining. Um, I think so, it's the uh, banter. Oh, God. um so uh uh aj do you want to give your review your vulture rating vulture rating yeah um i'd probably give it nine out of ten vultures i mean (laughs) it's you still (laughs) aj you're the only one with a degree that involves mathematics i don't see why you can't figure that that rounds to uh, four Point five, I think. I don't know, but <laughs> that's nine divided by two. Will that's not that hard? <laughs> Shut up! I can't. I can't do it. But um, yeah, mostly because it's like it's more an emotional experience than you know. It's it's an emotional connection with the movie, which is why I would give it such a high rating. 
Good. So, um, Sarah? Well, Will, I give this movie 20,000 and a half vampires. <laughs> What the? Don't, don't, don't let them do this to you. You were the only one. You were the only well, one who was obeying the rating system. You know what, and they Will, corrected you. <laughs> and when I say vampires, I mean Spike from Buffy the Vampire Slayer. So. Oh, God damn it. I, I haven't actually seen that particular you piece of go trash. Google, go Google his face, okay? I don't want to look at his face. I don't want to see anyone's face wanna right see, now. You want to see his super bad hair. Come on. Um, uh, but I'm just going to reiterate that I love this movie. Um, I, maybe it is something that women w would like more in general. It's, it's possible. That's the feeling I'm getting. Uh, but... I like how it's it when you come down to it, it's about this girl who has an objective and the entire movie is about her fulfilling this objective, whether you realize it or not. Mm -hmm. And I, I love a good psychological movie, to be honest. I love psychological thrillers and you know, I love how she psychologically tortures him and she's just mm. very capable at such a young age. And it is a bit absurd, you, you know. You don't watch this film and think, yeah, I bet that's happening to someone right now. It's not. Mm. It's, you don't have a 14-year-old girl <laughs> doing this to a pedophile. <laughs> right. Yeah. But that's I, Maybe that's one of the reasons I love it, though. Yeah. I, it's like it's almost this kind of fantasy of, you know, taking control of a bad situation. I think Sarah hit on a couple things that I would definitely agree on. Uh, the fact that, like, probably, like, females would enjoy it more. But, again... A specific type of female I feel the type of female who would have the fantasy of you know being in control and you know possibly even the fantasy of torturing someone <laughs> pedophile or not you know right <laughs> yeah I, I don't know I, I mean I, I like movies that are absurd I'm a huge fan of Doctor Strangelove, like Network was a fantastic movie. I, I mean, I've got nothing against movies that take a premise that seems believable initially and then blow it up to a point where it's it's basically slapstick. I think wonderful things have been done there. I just didn't feel like this movie ever gave you any insight into anything. Um, I don't really... I don't know. I, 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 I'm not <laughs> sure how I... I don't buy this, frankly, as a feminist movie. And maybe we can talk about that more in the part that includes spoilers. I, 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 I think it, it made me... From, there's a long, long debate that's been going on or that, people have, that people love to have about exploitation films, especially films like, you know, like I Spit on Your Grave or something like Grape Squad <laughs> that Rudy mentioned, where it's like... Well, is this a movie that – is this a kind of female revenge fantasy? And in that case, is it a feminist work? Or is this actually this kind of weird uh, sadomasochistic sort of fantasy that a lot of guys are getting off on? Um, and is it actually like – you know? It, and I, I think that this movie, while certainly apparently you – can watch it as a um, as a piece of female empowerment. I could also imagine a really masochistic pedophile getting his rocks off to this very easily. Yeah. Uh, and so I, I don't know. Maybe, maybe and, and sometimes films are both. I mean, maybe that's the reality, which is that the audience sees what they're going to see in it. I. Um, I did not like this movie. I didn't, didn't, didn't like it. Um, I, I did, if we have to be positive, I mentioned that I think Ellen Page gives a fantastic performance that really elevates uh, what I thought was some pretty lousy screenwriting. Like the script was there and Ellen Page was up here, and as a result, her character ends up in the middle somewhere. Um, there were a lot of scenes where her, some of the more tense scenes in the movie are tense because of her performance, because she, there are moments where she allows herself 
to seem frightened and vulnerable enough that you sympathize with her and that you begin to perceive Patrick Wilson's character as a potential threat, even though the screenplay doesn't doesn't give any doesn't do that at all. I don't don't want no spoilers here, but um, and there there's other just so uh, there's a lot more complexity to Ellen Page's performance than there is to the actual script of this film. So that was a that was a positive. I can't really speak to Patrick Wilson's performance. I think it was totally. I, I think he did the best with maybe what he was instructed to do, but he had a character that was so underwritten that I don't know. Anyway, if I have to rate this, I'm gonna, it's 1.5 out of five <laughs> vultures. <laughs> I, I called it. I knew that was going to be yeah. what I should have time stamped it. Yeah, you were. I know you were going to send it to Rudy or write it down or timestamp it, really, because I was on the fence between two vultures. That was my initial appraisal was two vultures, and the more I thought about it, I, I docked it half a point. Yeah. <laughs> Ouch. So that concludes our spoiler-free portion of – our spoiler-free reviews of the film, our spoiler-free portion of the podcast – as usual, I encourage you to to close the uh, – if you haven't watched the film yet, I encourage you to stop the podcast now, pause it, uh, save it, bookmark it, whatever. And I encourage you to come back to it after uh, you've watched the film. But if you don't care about spoilers, if you're one of those people whose enjoyment of a film is actually enriched – by seeing someone really debate it in depth beforehand, stick around. Um, either way, there'll be a link to a link in the blog post to somewhere where you can view or buy the film. Okay, so spoilers. <laughs> Since we're now officially in spoiler territory, this is what I wanted to say about the dialogue. There's a castration scene in this movie, and after the castration scene, she holds up what are uh, not actually the character's balls, but uh, her testicles, but what we're supposed to believe are his testicles. And she says something like, oh, I guess they weren't made of brass. And that moment, to me, <laughs> as a man <laughs> was about 10,000 times more painful than the cat than the, the castration that preceded it <laughs> that that like honestly i was watching the castration scene and I was like, eh, eh, well, checking my watch and then she said that and i was like oh <laughs> i i i don't know guys <laughs> There was actually something I wanted to say about Patrick Wilson's character. Mm -hmm. since, since we were talking about how uh, he wasn't very fleshed out or well written. One of the things I really didn't like, they tried to give him a little bit of a backstory with oh, yeah. his girlfriend. And then mm -hmm. and she's like, oh, well, may, or what are you trying to like chase down the, this like idea of what you want because of her? And I just thought, well, that's pretty bullshit. Yeah, that that is. If, if they are trying to use that as an excuse, it was sort of like in Lolita, where he yes. where he where he you has the dead thirteen year old girlfriend, and oh, yeah, maybe that's Annabelle why I'm Lee. a pedophile. No, right. that's not why you're a pedophile. Right. You just are a pedophile. <laughs> right, I'm <laughs> that's glad not how it works. Right, I'm glad you mentioned Lolita because I was going to mention Lolita. Yeah. That his like former flame who he's obsessed with is straight out of Lolita. And it's also such a reductive take on like that concept in Lolita. I mean, may, may, okay, so I'm gonna, <laughs> Lolita is like one of my favorite novels of right, all same time. Here. Yeah. Uh, and it's really fantastic how deep uh, Nabokov gets into Umber Umber's psychology and how just incredibly complex and nuanced he is and how he's able to do that without any at any point in time like making him any more or less a monster than he needs to be like he never becomes this complete like 
the, the, he never becomes a Hannibal Lecter, right? He never becomes this complete inhuman creature, even though he thinks he's becoming it, which is really – his level of, like, self-awareness is really fascinating. But on the other hand, it never becomes, like, you know – apologism for pedophilia it never becomes like oh she's okay (laughs) it's just really a really complex thing that's totally aware of what the consequences of his actions are but also totally aware that he's a complex and troubled human being and that was really and to see like the screenwriter and the director whoever is responsible for this shit like take who obviously read lolita Take that was his takeaway, like the first chapter or the first two chapters of Lolita, right. the Annabelle Lee stuff. Like, oh, so this he he had some kind of romantic experience at that age with someone who was that age, and now he can't let go of it. Okay, and that was it. That was it. And, now he, that was it. and he and then he put the book yeah. down. And he's like, let me hit the keyboard. <laughs> and, and I, I just oh. It just, yeah, the, it just it seemed very flimsy to did. me, and I didn't really understand the point of it because you have this guy who obviously is going after these young girls. He's mm-hmm. probably hurting them. Um, mm-hmm. So <laughs> the idea that he's still kind of obsessed with his ex girlfriend to such a degree, I just I just don't buy it. We're, we're I don't I definitely don't buy that that had any impact on the way he is now um, as a pedophile. <laughs> yeah. Right. I, exactly. Or if that that needed to be fleshed out, I don't think his th- – th- there's just no through line there. I mean h- how many people had a, you know, a girlfriend when they were in their early to mid-teens? Or how many people out there had their first sexual encounter at like whatever, you know, in their early teens, their mid-teens, whatever? And the, the vast majority of those people are not walking around – like still obsessed with their first girlfriend and fucking 13 year olds, you know, that there's got to be more to it than that. And the other attempts to add to it like that, that monologue that he gives Um, about how his aunt abused him because she caught him with her daughter and the daughter, and there was something, it it was a totally innocent thing according to him. Yada, yada, yada. It's like, that doesn't really. and, And I mean, Ellen Page calls bullshit on it immediately, which is great, I guess, but it's not really – it doesn't add anything. It, it was – that monologue came – first of all, was in no way reflected in his behavior. Like he is such a calm, cool, collected character. I, I apologize for the alliteration through most of the movie. <laughs> Like, if this was some kind of neurotic fixation he had that was rooted to a, in a moment of abuse, you would think there would be, like, he'd be a more neurotic character instead of being this very, this very flat. I, I, and so it, it felt like the, screen, he, uh, the screenwriter, once again, who you can always see, like, jabbing away at his keyboard during this, <laughs> was like, oh, I've seen these cool scenes in other movies where the antagonist <laughs> gives this monologue about his past and how painful it was, and that helps to explain him. So let me drop one of those in there, even though, like, it, it, it really has no connection to the character I'm writing right now. Yeah. Not to mention, also, by the way, if – that was the case if that story was true and the roots of this obsession of his were in a moment of like weird like like a moment of weird sexual awakening followed by him being physically abused and tortured then shouldn't he be getting off right now during this movie <laughs> like if that's the root of if, if that's the root of it all then this then everything that's happening to him during this film should be tied to that weird psychosexual like complex he has and yet Every scene in the movie, he just acts like he's being tortured. Like, there's no – like, I feel like if he if he has this sexual obsession with young girls and he also – and the sexual obsession, obsession is basically tied to an act of torture he experienced in his past. And what he describes with his aunt is basically an act of torture. Then shouldn't the fact that right now he's being tortured by a 14-year-old girl – be helping like shouldn't he be aroused 
<laughs> and, and I think it would have been a more interesting movie, frankly, if you were wondering at any given moment, like, is Patrick Wilson's character like, does he have a heart on <laughs> because, because that would be more psychologically complex, and I think that would be more true to what's going on in the movie. Instead, Patrick Wilson's character throughout the movie just plays it like, He's being tortured. I'm uncomfortable in this situation. Won't you let me go? I'm worried. I'm scared. <laughs> and I think I would think there'd be more to it than that under the circumstances. Um, and maybe the maybe the filmmakers didn't really want to go there. But I mean, you've opened this can of worms anyway. <laughs> I don't know. That sort of plays to the like feminist trash comic book sort of feel to it. Of like, if you're coming at it from that direction, that would be something that you would exclude. Yeah, yeah. I, I yeah. guess. And every you might say, oh, "Sorry, story. every villain has an origin story." I mean, <laughs> <laughs> I, mean I guess, and, and I guess the argument for excluding it would be like, well, and like pedos would be getting off or something but i don't think so it's like one of those things where like if you saw patrick wilson was aroused by this i think you would be less likely to be able to be aroused by it if you like you there would be some meta level of understanding there'd be some kind of revulsion some level of disgust some level like oh he's a sicko um, whereas I think the way it plays out now, it's so straight faced that it really could be like if you were once again a masochist, masochistic pedal watching this, I think your experience would be improved by how straight Patrick Wilson is playing it. But I don't know. Because you'd be like, like the fantasy is complete then, right? There's nothing to distract you from the fantasy. There's nothing to force you to be self-aware when you're watching it. My, uh, Mr. Bones totally disagrees with me, though. So I <laughs> Mr. Bones. I feel like that would possibly make Ellen Page more of a good guy, in quotes, though. Hmm. Like, you would be able to be like, oh, he's a sicko, you know. She's hmm. doing the right thing. Whereas... For the most of the film, you're like, eh, she's kind of, like, she's basically crazy, you know, regardless of whether or not he's a pedophile. Like, yes, yeah, she's a vigilante. Like, that's what she's hmm. doing. I agree that that was the intent, um, that you were supposed, the film was supposed to make you like feel like is ellen page doing the right thing like is she is she deranged and is he just a victim here but the move at no point in the movie was did i ever think that first of all he wasn't a pedophile i mean obviously he was the circumstances yeah. under which they met and all of that and at no point in the movie did i honestly believe that he had nothing to do with the disappearance of the other girl who ellen page is apparently maybe avenging um, because right. I, but yeah. you're definitely not like that's not the question of is he just a victim it's more of a what what the hell is she doing you know like mm. even if she is a pedophile she's doing it's more than the Batman vigilante of Batman doesn't kill people and he you know just wraps up the villains for the police mm. It's her involving herself, like, extremely personally, even though she's extremely um, not personally involved. Like, there's a castration scene. Like, right. basically, she's exacting this. Um, she's very professional and detached throughout the movie, which, you know, you can view that as her character not being as developed, or you can view it as a question of whether or not she's in any way actually the protagonist. And that sort of feels like, um, that feels like a notch in the viewing it as a feminist film because 
but then an, a, a slightly odd, you know, um, exploitation sort of feminist film because certain people would want the fantasy of not being the good guy while still doing the right mm. questionably thing. I think that I, I think that if the premise is that you're supposed to relate to Patrick Wilson's character and feel sympathy for him and wonder if Ellen Page's character isn't taking this too far, which apparent, I, I really do think the film wants you to wonder that. I, I think it's really hard to do that when the character who is sympathetic is a pedophile. I don't think you're supposed to emphasize with the pedophile at all. I don't really think, like even, even in the backstory moments for him, your main impression is either, oh, he's flat, he's he's nothing. This is uh, not like he doesn't make sense as a character, or it's that he's trying to manipulate her. Mm. There's another scene where um, you know he tries to get her to release him, and she pretends that she believes him and is just, you know, an upset teenager in order to make a point, right. which is a very gimmicky moment, but again, it sort of lends to that perception that this pedophile is the character who is supposed to reflect Ellen Page's character. Ellen Page's character is really the main character here sure yeah I, I certainly agree with that both sympathetic with her and to have questions about like is she like she's definitely taking it too far but you're is she like she's <laughs> supposed to be a 14 year old and mm -hmm. she's performing you know castration on a stranger she met over the internet like that is a comic book thing but oh yeah <laughs> It's still in a real life setting where you know they're real people. It's not animated or anything. It's it's real. Mm -hmm. And there's another moment where <laughs> she calls a friend uh, while in the other room. Jeff is tied up on the table, and she's like, uh, "Yeah, I'm I'm gonna be done earlier than I thought. Want to go catch a movie?" <laughs> right. <laughs> right. And that thought races through your head of like, "Oh, this is like a." This is a young girl, and she's doing these things. Right. And it it's it's not you know it's not a normal thing. No, I mean not, obviously it's not a normal thing to like drug a pedophile and pretend to castrate him and force yeah, him to exactly. hang himself. <laughs> but uh, I, I'm not <laughs> sure if that like the thing is how how complex is that really from the point of view of the audience? Is there ever any reason? not to be totally on the side of Ellen Page's character? Is there ever really any reason to say, oh, no, wait? You no. know? Uh, I mean, because it, Because he's such, like, he's such a straw man pedophile, you know, that it's like, well, all right. Like, <laughs> how many people are going to be like, oh, no, don't castrate that pedophile? <laughs> 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 I, I don't know. I... I I I will say that actually since you you brought up the precocious child precocious teen thing again I, I will say that okay I'm I'm gonna, I'm gonna be totally frank here I don't I don't like precocious teens I don't I don't <laughs> like them uh, I, I don't like precocious children those fucking shows on NPR <laughs> where people like bring on their eight-year-old and he plays some concerto on a fucking oh god and and like and then his dad uh, talks about all the scholarships he's already won those those make me feel deeply inadequate as a human being uh, <laughs> right. and all but I think that in some ways this is a perfect precocious teen movie in that on the surface this is an incredibly sophisticated uh ambitious film uh but in reality it's mostly just 
in imitation. <laughs> like it knows all the beats it has to hit, and it hits those beats exactly like you'd expect it to, right? It's got it's got that violin out, and it's playing it's playing exactly it's playing exactly what's on the sheet, right? It, it, it's doing Wait. exactly, and it's doing it in a really sophisticated way. Um, in a way that you would not expect a 14 year old or a 12 year old or whatever to be able to play it. But there's at no, but there's not the depth, the improvisation, the, the, the sophistication, the complexity, the, 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 the nuance, whatever you want to say that you would get if you were listening to a real master play that same piece of music. And in fact, that 12 year old is probably going to grow up to be a pretty mediocre adult once they once once that, that skill set that they've mastered be, becomes something that uh, is, is no longer exceptional for their age range. They're not necessarily going to grow up to be a, ge a creative genius just because they mastered the mechanics of this act. And I feel like this film mastered the mechanics of what it's supposed to do to be a psychological thriller. And above and beyond that, it didn't really do much more than that. It, I, I thought it was a very hollow, superficial film. And it really, I, I hate precocious. So maybe, maybe there was, <laughs> I, maybe I'm naturally just not going to like a film like this, but I really felt like that's exactly what was going on here. Like this is, this is, like a precocious child movie on more than just one level. <laughs> yeah. I mean, the precocious <coughs> children are basically my cup of tea, so. Yeah. <laughs> children aren't my cup of tea at all in any way, so. But yeah, I like, see, I don't. Apparently, I like clinically insane children. So. <laughs> yeah, clinically insane children and people in general are pretty awesome. <laughs> <laughs> so, does anyone else? Well, I I have something else I want to bitch about here, but before I do, I, I thought maybe. <laughs> um. I don't. I can't think of anything. Okay, the ti timer's <laughs> counting down before I go on another tirade. It's just. <laughs> it's not, it's <laughs> okay, so here, here's the thing. <laughs> <laughs> this is this is something else that bothered me about the film. Let me let me offer you a hypothetical situation. I don't believe this actually happened, but if you told me this is what happened, I would buy it. Right? Now imagine a screenwriter. He's sitting at his computer. He's trying he, he he's decided he's going to write a revenge thriller thriller. He's got, going to write the kind of movie that Charles Charles Bronson or Mel Gibson might star in, right? <laughs> or, or now Liam Neeson, since Liam Neeson doesn't give a fuck anymore. Um, <laughs> and it, it's it's about a man, right, whose child is abducted by a pedophile and murdered <laughs> right and mm. this man we'll say it's played by mel gibson because in my imagination that's the most entertaining <laughs> way uh, and this man poses to be a little girl on the internet manages to entrap the pedophile take gets is, ties the pedophile to a chair in his home and proceeds to torture him castrate him and force him to kill himself um that's a pretty routine revenge thriller story um, mm -hmm. Now imagine this screenwriter takes the movie to fucking Paramount or MGM or whoever fucking was responsible for this. <laughs> and some producer looks at it and he's like, "I like this. I like this a lot, but Mel Gibson's not available. Liam Neeson won't sell his soul to us for another four or five years, and Charles Bronson is dying of cancer." Uh, and we really can't, we can't, we don't want to cast this with like some, some, we, we need a gimmick to sell this movie because we can't cast a named actor. Uh, how, and the screenwriter's like, shit, I really want to sell this script. And he's like, I know what, what if, what if the protagonist 
is not the father, but another 14 year old. Girl. <laughs> 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 and, and, and the movie, movie studio executive says, I love it. <laughs> <laughs> and the screenwriter figures, I, I'm going to sell this script, spec script for not that much money. I've already put a lot of fucking work into this. How little can I change in order to make that work? And I feel like this is that movie, right? I feel like you could you could just change two or three scenes in this movie, cast Mel Gibson, cast Liam Neeson, film it, and and you'd be watching roughly the same movie. And, and that's part of what bothered me about it, is that I don't think that, aside from the really exceptional performance that Alan Page gave, I don't think that this is really much else much other than a very normal, um, you know, confinement psychological thriller, revenge thriller, uh, with a casting gimmick. I mean, I think now tell me why I'm wrong. <laughs> Fuck you, Will. <laughs> <laughs> no, I I see your point, but it really. Like if it had been that, where it was always the father doing it, I, it would not have interested me that much, to be honest, because it would have been a little more generic. Uh, it would have been more emotional instead of psychological. <laughs> and the psychological aspect is one of the reasons I like it. <laughs> and the, the fact that it's, it is a 14-year-old girl with obvious mental issues and who is very precocious and thinks she's smart and actually is smart. It's what makes it interesting because it really she does make the movie. It's nobody else makes the movie, mm -hmm. and I don't think Mel Gibson would have made the movie. <laughs> I, I agree with you there. I mean, there's no question that Ellen Page makes the movie. Yeah, yeah. yeah but uh, no, I I do see what you mean, <laughs> where you could switch it up, but it would it, it would have been a totally different movie because you wouldn't have had that meetup in the cafe, they, you know, he wouldn't have said, oh, hi, older guy, let me take you to my place. <laughs> well, yeah, but you know, that, that, film, <laughs> that, that scene would have had to have been a little bit different, <laughs> right? He would have had to have been waiting in the parking lot with some chloroform yeah, on a rag exactly. or something for him to come back. To so park, it, it would have been a bit more boring. It Actually, that does sound like a Liam Neeson film, though. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> We should review all the Taken this movie. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> hmm. Yeah. It, I definitely agree with Sarah there that um, Alan Page was basically the focus of the movie. And, um, I mean, it would have been nice to see more. Like, if it was a movie about, like, pedophilia, which... If it was just a generic, you know, revenge story between Mel Gibson and the pedophile, it wouldn't really be about pedophilia at all. Like, that would be a subject in the movie and not part of the film. But since it is, um, since it is Ellen Page, you expect there to be this interaction between them that's based on, you know, like... a some type of delving into there's an interaction and <laughs> there's like pedophilia involved because <laughs> of these two characters which there isn't really right but i think that that sort of distracts from the kind of you know gung-ho anti-hero 14 year old girl who is you know, vigilante 14 year old girl and that's kind of what i liked about the film rudy correct me if i'm wrong but didn't you describe this to me as like pedophile kick-ass at one point <laughs> yeah but yeah i think uh, yep i mean that's what it that's what the first thing i thought of i mean it's really violent kind of over the top in some ways um, and yeah, I mean, <laughs> it felt very comic booky. I, I mean, that's what, and that's not a bad thing. I don't really think. Yeah. I don't like comic books or comic book <laughs> movies. Um, 
graphic novels. I'm not a big fan of um, <laughs> Alan Moore or any movie that's been made based on a work by Alan Moore. Uh, outside of The Dark Knight, I can't really think of a comic book movie that I truly loved. A few that maybe I like. I thought, oh, yeah, that was fun. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, I, I mean, there's definitely some real issues of like ingrained taste here since, mm. since we talked a little about like the first scene of the movie or technically the second scene of the movie like the setup how she entraps him can, can i just say something about <laughs> the very first scene of the movie when right. she's talking to him in the chat room or on i am or whatever and her screen thong name girl. is her screen name is thong girl 13 <laughs> Uh, here, here's the thing. There's a there's a <laughs> that. First of all, from the perspective of the character that Ellen Page's character Haley is playing, like the the way she wants to be perceived as this mm. kind of precocious teenager who's like this kind of smart, sort of alienated loner looking looking for companionship. That screen name doesn't work at all. <laughs> yeah. Like that screen name in no way lines up with the other character. The mm. rest of the attributes of this like fake character she created to entrap him. If anything, it screams, I'm just looking for someone to fuck me. And I, I don't think that work. Like I, I don't I think there's some disunity there. But more strikingly, so this Patrick Wilson Wilson <laughs> character, he is supposed to be a really sophisticated pedophile. Here's a guy who has obviously <laughs> had relations. I, I think we can assume based on like what transpires over the course of the movie that he doesn't just photograph 13 like young girls right like he claims <laughs> initially that he's had relationships with a bunch of underage girls that he's able to actually use as his cover the fact that he's a photographer of underage girls which seems like a really fucking dumb thing <laughs> 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 like like my cover for being a pedophile is that i'm a pedophile <laughs> no, you <don't> understand. <laughs> You don't. You don't understand. I. I. I don't. I don't want to fuck young girls. I just want to take revealing photographs. Uh, I mean, it didn't work for Lewis Carroll. I mean, I don't know. That. That's true. It did. It did work for Lewis Carroll. You've got a. You've got a strong point there. Okay. No, I. I completely agree about that. Actually, because with the, the yeah, yeah, photograph, the that, difference well. he was just. <laughs> If he was just a photographer who just right. photographed, you know, nature and adults, that'd be different. Right. But he like specifically photographed underage girls. I'm like, right, that's, that's his thing. Lie. And at one and point, he, he he defends himself. He puts them up. Yeah. He's like, oh, you know, I took all these like these environmental photographs too, and that's <laughs> right. like the core of my work. But, and then Ellen Page's character is like, yeah, but they're not hanging on the wall. <laughs> like, their walls are not, I'm sorry, but like. Yeah. And, and like, but he has like his all his kitty porn in this safe, right, in his house. And it's yeah. like, it's like, well, when the cops come in after they caught you, they got your IP address. <laughs> <laughs> but they open the door and they see all these pictures of scantily clad little girls on your walls. They're not going to be like, oh, well, he probably doesn't have kitty porn <laughs> for the way. <laughs> but, yeah, I mean, but above and beyond that, oh, sorry, Rudy. I agree. There were some, like, if you, I guess you could call it world building issues. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Like, I just the way his that. apartment is set up. <laughs> like, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, a pedophile lives there. I mean, it looks like basically like a modern art dungeon. <laughs> <laughs> I mean,. But I do want to get – I was making a point about the Thong Girl 13 thing, right? And so Patrick Wilson is apparently such an incredibly sophisticated pedophile that, you know, as I said, his cover is basically that I just photographed the girls, and he's able to get away with that. He, he, the, the movie may, makes you believe that he apparently abducted and participated in the murder of a girl and totally didn't get caught by the police. He, he regularly apparently – downloads kitty porn and has sex with <laughs> underage girls and he's gotten away with all that if i am patrick wilson the magic 
sophisticated, like genius pedophile <laughs> who can only be caught by like Ellen Page's Hannibal Lecter genius vigilante. <laughs> And I'm on the in a chat room, like looking for my next target, right? And I get messaged by Thong Girl Thirteen. I don't know. I think my Spidey senses are too- <laughs> like even if I even if I can't conceive of the idea that maybe this is some little girl who's trying to entrap me. Boy, I'm gonna be like, that's probably the feds. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But but well, remember. He wasn't alone in that rape and murder. There was Aaron, who we only found out about at the end, oh, which was right. kind of a curveball. Oh, which was another but, plot. You don't know who initiated contact or mm. you know, who started it or anything. Yeah. So that, was, that was another thing where they just didn't really go into enough detail, but it right. was kind of, you know. But if he is a sloppy enough pedophile to <laughs> openly arrange a play date with Don Girl 13, <laughs> he's in jail. He's in jail years ago. He's done. He's locked up. He, he's dead in a, in a prison shower somewhere. Yeah. No, I agree. That doesn't make sense to me. That, you know, the, the photographs on the wall, he's very obvious and he is very confident that nobody's going to figure it out, <laughs> even yeah. though he's well, like, so these girls who apparently come in for these photo sessions, don't they have parents or agents with them? <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, right. Are they yeah. suspicious, really? And yeah. can he really, when he's doing that, like, appear totally calm and controlled in front of, like, the uh-huh. parents and the agents? <laughs> and if he does, then, I don't know. Then why is he, like, eh, there's something, something just... <laughs> yeah. Why is he doing that? Why is he doing that? Like, <laughs> I don't know, guys. Um. No, and now we'll go good. into Will teaches us how to be a smart pedophile. No. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not giving classes. Come on. <laughs> Um, no, see, I almost, just to put something in, I almost like that because, again, the cheesy horror movie thing of, like, you know, I mean, that's the point at which you're screaming, like, you know, don't go in that room. You know, don't <laughs> yeah. Go that's, like, <laughs> I, I mean, I don't know. There were a couple of scenes like that, like the yeah, scene with were. the gun, like, <laughs> where he got the gun off the bed, like, while he was tied to the chair, and then he rolled <laughs> out into the hallway. And then instead yeah. of staying in the hallway, he rolled into the living room or whatever, and she got him. And I was like, well, yeah. what? Are you doing? Like, don't do that. <laughs> and another one where he, like, he picked out the knife and went searching for it instead right, of, right. like, running away. <laughs> it was... Or, or get, getting the gun or checking to see yeah. if maybe she had the gun. Right. <laughs> like... It's his gun! It's not like he should have even forgotten that the gun was there. It's his fucking gun. All right. Like, oh. It was literally like, you know, the the you know, college age female standing in front of the door and everyone in the audience is like, No, don't fucking do that. <laughs> uh, now what do you think about it? He was really fucking dumb. Like he didn't make any smart moves at all in this movie. <laughs> he did yeah. Not. And you're right. He, like he's supposed to be sophisticated. He has the looks for it. You know, he's handsome, yeah. and I guess he's charming. So really, he would be the perfect pedophile if he weren't so stupid. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. But again, it's that you know, basically that comic book horror movie, mm-hmm. you know, setup. Mm. Yeah. But, like I mean, I feel like. Oh, oh. No, go well, on. Um, oh, well, I feel like if. You know, like if Cell Block D, you know, the sex offenders where they keep them or whatever, was watching this movie as like, a, you know, on a movie night, a theoretical movie night they had in prison. You know, and like there's the one black guy there, you know, who's in the audience. He's going to be screaming at this guy like, what are you doing? <laughs> no, don't go in that room. Ah. You know, that, that's, you know, that's what I was thinking the whole time. Like... <laughs> Rudy, are you the one black guy in the audience? Well, no, because I'm not on Soul Block D and, you know, pedophile <laughs> row or whatever. But <laughs> that's the way I feel like, you know, like some of the things he did were just fucking just 
stupid, like people said. I, it just, I don't know. It, it, I don't. For me, it didn't hurt the movie because, again, the comic book weirdness and the villains always, you know, they give the monologue, and it's like, oh, <laughs> and, <laughs> well, Batman's setting up to shoot him or whatever. But I mean, <laughs> you know, it didn't. I, I could see that hurting somebody's, you know view of this as a serious movie or whatever. I don't know. Well, I, I never really had a view of it. Since that's the first scene, I, I kind of was like, oh, this isn't going to be a serious movie. <laughs> <laughs> if anything, I was let down by following scenes by like how serious it tried to be. <laughs> but one thing, I kind of building off of that a little bit, though, what you were saying about those scenes where like he does really stupid things is – if a movie with this formula generally has a few notes it has to hit, and one of those notes is like the reversal, especially if Patrick Wilson is supposed to be the antagonist, mm -hmm. there should be a moment where, if you're following the formula, where he's clearly revealed to be the antagonist, he gains the upper hand over the protagonist, and you feel, feel a moment of like tension. And there are a couple of moments that are almost like that, but Huey gains the upper hand so fast. Mm -hmm. and, and, it, it's bad. and by the end of the film, you wonder if there was ever a moment where he even came remotely close to having the upper hand. And I think that took some of the tension out of the movie. And in fact, yeah. if anyone but Ellen Page was playing the character, I think there would have been no moments of tension at all. Because it, it's just moments that you get brief moments of tension – like after the scene where he gets the gun and she has to like get him with the saran wrap and he knocks her against the wall and there is with his chair and that that seems ridiculous on its face but it felt <laughs> real enough because of Ellen Page's performance and because of that panic moment where she's like hyperventilating afterwards right and then the moment uh, something similar happens when he she has him set up on the noose and he like swings over and he grabs her mm. And for a moment, you're like, oh, this is ch this, like the dynamics here are turning. I feel some tension. I'm worried about Ellen Page's character. But it pivots so quickly away from that to another moment when she's in absolute, complete control that all the tension goes out of the movie really fast. And it becomes, you really do, in some ways, start to feel almost bad for Patrick Wilson's character. Because for 99.9% .9 of this movie, he is just being tortured. <laughs> and brutalized. And yeah, he's a terrible pedophile, but we never get to he never becomes dangerous enough that yeah, you want true. him to that you want to see him get his come up in. So he never has that moment where he becomes scary. And I feel like this and in fact the move maybe it was in the script because there's that one moment where he like he's punching the wall, right? He's oh, I'm gonna get you. I hate women, basically. <laughs> the point where he's supposed to feel this is like I think the point there was that was supposed to be a moment of psychological insight. Like, oh, he's a closet misogynist. What you know he's got this pedophile has it has women issues. But like the way Patrick Wilson <laughs> did it, it just seemed like a totally <laughs> understandable moment of frustration. Right. Like I've just been tortured for an hour and a, and a half. Maybe I'm maybe I'm a little pissed off and I'm gonna punch the wall. It didn't seem like he became unhinged. You know, it, it wasn't like um, Jack uh, Jack um, Nicholson's moment in the in the shining when you can tell he's boop, he's gone right right it, it, or like like moments you get with the joker in the dark knight or other characters who like are who sh suddenly they're revealed to be like sociopaths they're revealed to right. be like oh they were a lunatic all along what do you know or they've become a lunatic or they've been driven mad there wasn't anything like that it was just like yeah he, he's like she just tied down and pretend tied him down and pretended to castrate him. He's kind of frustrated. <laughs> and he's gonna hit the wall. <laughs> I mean, yeah, like I think that was what I was talking about earlier when I said that like there's a little bit of a struggle because you're supposed to sympathize with Ellen Page, but then Basically, Patrick Wilson's character becomes so, like, pathetic. Like, he's not a threat that you wonder, you know? <laughs> You're like, <laughs> well, like, yeah, he's a pedophile, but, like, this is above and beyond, you know? 
Yeah. Right. I wonder, though, in the imagination of most audience members, if there's anything that's legitimately above and beyond when it comes to torturing a pedophile, though. Like, oh, that's too much. Like, don't do that to that 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 <laughs> child rapist. <laughs> I, I, I don't know. I, yeah. I mean, I never felt conflicted about it personally. So I don't know mm -hmm. what that says about my moral compass. Because <laughs> I know I have my limits, but in this movie, nothing she did bothered me. <laughs> I, I guess I just felt like, yeah, he deserves it. I tend to agree with you there, uh, with one exception, and once again, that's the dialogue. That I, I, I was, I was, I felt that was moral. <laughs> it was morally abhorrent for her to talk. <laughs> <laughs> like tie a, pa a pedophile to the a table, castrate him, force him to hang himself, torture him, drug him, wh whatever. I don't, I don't care. But don't talk like that. Don't do better <laughs> than that. Don't, don't do that. See, but I, see, I think that was part of her being precocious, the way she talked, because she, she didn't talk like a normal teenager or you know human being. Supposed to be affected, you know, where she's sort of trying to play adult and mm. she's letting you know that she's got psychological issues. <laughs> That's sort of interesting, the idea that maybe on some level she's, like, play-acting Hannibal Lecter. Like, maybe she watched <laughs> yeah. Silence of the Lambs before she drove, she, like, got oh. in her sister's car or whatever. And <laughs> I mean, I, I think so, because she didn't, I mean, I guess she physically hurt him to a degree, but she didn't really brutalize him physically that much. It was more psychological. Mm -hmm. The worst thing yeah. she did was force him to hang himself. But, yeah, but I mean, she I, didn't some physical <laughs> harm there. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't think it was too bad under the circumstances. Con especially considering what he probably would have done to her. Mm -hmm. Without even being provoked, he probably would have done way worse. To right, him. right. I mean, certainly this is a movie about psychological torture more than it is about physical <laughs> torture. Absolutely. <laughs> okay, uh, I think we're over an hour now. I don't know because, as I we are definitely over an hour. There's some really audio nice. that we need to <laughs> trim out, but I don't know. Uh, anyone? I think we should keep it well. I no, I, I don't want to subject anyone to that. Um, anyone have anything they want to say before we wrap up? Any last final thoughts about the movie? So I was reading um, something about the script, and it said that originally they had decided that they wanted to at the end when she calls into question whether or not her name is really Haley. They also mm -hmm. said that they wanted to reveal that she was actually 18, but she huh. looked younger. Hmm. Um, what are your guys' thoughts? They decided to leave it out in the end, but yeah. what do you think about if they had decided to leave I, it out? I personally think... Um, watching the movie with the idea that she is 14 has more of an impact, but if she was 18, it would have been a little more realistic, you know, like uh, that she, maybe she's a little more independent because a 14 year old going off on her own like that for hours and hours, hmm. you know, you, you do wonder, is, is anybody wondering where she is or is she just a really, really good liar? I, um, I don't know. I, I mean, I, I feel like that would have just been one more plot contrivance. I don't think it would have really explained that much. I don't think it would have added that much yeah. to the film. I think, if anything, it would have diluted the gimmick of the film or the premise mm -hmm. of the film a little bit. So, eh. I, I, if anything, it might have made the film just incrementally worse. Yeah, I agree with that. Did anyone else, like, get that impression at all from the film? No. I didn't. I didn't know. At the end, when she was like walking away from the house after she forced him to kill himself, um, I initially did kind of get that impression of that they wanted you to see her as like 
more of like basically not a character but more an idea kind of mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. a type of like um personality but not you know defined in specifics which is yeah you know, one of the reasons why like I an really... avenging angel kind of thing yeah but mm-hmm. like kind of like a movement almost mm-hmm. um mm-hmm. Oh, like the V for Vendetta thing, where like I was oh, just about to say that, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> something like that. But like, like how many <laughs> little red riding hoods are there out there avenging pedof- Yeah. Um, yeah. somewhat, but more like you know, where where did she come from? What the fuck is she doing? Like, <laughs> who is she? And that, like, you know, as gimmicky as it is, the fact that it's her and it's you know a young female regardless of how old she is that's something that struck me as a mm. Mm. I um <clears throat> as far as that last scene is concerned I think I had a similar feeling to you in that you really wonder well who is this person what are the depths of what she's capable of is she some kind of serial killer a pedophile i mean she had her she certainly had basically her superhero uniform on at that point with her when she put on the little red riding uh, the actual red hoodie i thought that was i rolled my eyes so hard (laughs) i thought that was so on the nose it's like oh okay it's like you just cribbed shamelessly from lolita now you're gonna have this like really 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 overt reference to little red riding hood and like have us think that she's some kind of little red riding hood serial killer <sighs> <laughs> i i don't know it was it, it was it wasn't the straw that broke <laughs> the camel's back because i had bailed long before that moment they certainly <laughs> didn't help sell the film for me <laughs> i mean i'm definitely on board with like a little red riding hood serial killer Seriously, so So, I guess that might be where the past diverge. Mm. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I can get behind that. Yeah. <laughs> Only Will can't. Yeah, I, 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 I can't. I don't know. I can't get just the contrivance <laughs> after contrivance after contrivance. Uh, Rudy, do you have any one, final thoughts or one final thought? I would like to uh, say. Um, this film, the guy who made it, David Slade, uh, directed mostly, um, music videos, uh, <laughs> before he, and that's not to shit on him. I'm not trying to say this guy is whatever, but this film, I mean, there were some parts of it and the aesthetic in general of it seemed a lot like a music video. <laughs> I mean, yeah. And yeah. So, yeah. And that. That uh, I like that. I mean, I, yeah, I, I, I agree. And it seemed like one of those. Uh, I don't know if it's. I don't know if I have kind of nostalgia for like the early like two thousand, <laughs> like two two thousand three, where there was those like grunge bands that you know made the video. All the videos were like the house and shit was breaking apart and like they're thrashing <laughs> around and the fucking middle of that, this house like exploding and like it being thrown all like a poltergeist type of effect or something but i kind of got that from a lot of the scenes like you could pretty much like dub music over some of the scenes particularly like the part where she's thrashing back and forth and hitting her head against the wall because she fucked up you know right. like i could i could see like that being in like uh you know like a uh, Three Doors Down or Three Days Grace or whatever the fuck the band's called. <laughs> One of those type of, <laughs> type of videos. You know, I mean, it's almost like like it was musical. I don't know. It had a musical quality to it. Yeah, I can see that. Absolutely. Any other final thoughts as we wrap up here? Uh, I have one. And it's not exactly a thought necessarily. It's just a little factoid about the movie in case anybody was wondering or you might already know. I don't know. But if anybody was wondering about Haley's appearance, like her actual physical appearance in the film, because she isn't what would immediately come to my mind of like the perfect 
victim <laughs> for a pedophile. Mm -hmm. But um, actually, when I first watched this movie 10 years ago, I also watched uh, some of the uh, extras, you know, some of the background mm -hmm. details. And apparently Ellen Page had done a movie before this where she shaved her head. So that explains oh. the short hair. Yeah, yeah, because I was kind of wondering, cause, you know, you think, well, she's not exactly like the pretty feminine little victim that you would imagine at first. Instead, right. they go for this tomboyish girl with, you know, very, very short hair and it works so well. Yeah. It really does because of, it because does. of Ellen yeah. Page, it really does. Yeah. So right. Anyway, I just thought I would throw that out there in case anybody right. was watching it and wondering why she looks like that. <laughs> I would yeah. agree that's one element that definitely works. Um, mm. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Sure. Any Anything else before we close here on Hard Candy? I think I'm good. Unless you want to tell us some more about how much you <laughs> no, I mean I I, I I feel like I've I've got catharsis here. I, I got my <laughs> hour and a half of bitching out about the movie <laughs> to um you know to make up for the hour and a half or so that I had to spend watching it. Although it felt like so much more than that for a movie that's supposed to be like tense and. <laughs> No, I'm done. I'm done. I'm, fuck it. We had a conversation yeah. before where you spoke at length about it. So about what? About the movie. Your <laughs> should be Oh yeah, important. yeah. No, I, 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 everyone. I have already bitched about this movie to everyone but Sarah. <laughs> uh, I had, a, I had a conversation with Rudy as well. I uh, spent a lot of time rehearsing for all the things I would say about how much I hate this movie. <laughs> Um, all right, so I think we will leave it at that. Um, certainly, if you haven't watched a movie for yourself, watch it for yourself, or don't. <laughs> uh, <laughs> no, let, let this conversation, if, you have, if you've made it this far and you're intrigued, and, um, you know, watch it. And it's certainly three, two people here think this movie absolutely love this movie one person thinks it's a wonderful like way to send a spend a saturday like with a beer in your underoos and one person thought it was garbage so you, you can you know <laughs> you, you listen to the arguments make up your mind decide for yourself uh watch the movie and then uh if you really hated it you think it's a waste of your time you can send hate mail to Sarah and AJ, and if you if you think it's a wonderful movie, if you think it's a great piece of feminist pop art, uh, send your hate mail to me. <laughs> <laughs> so um, we'll be doing this again, hopefully in two weeks, and it's Rudy's turn to pick a movie. What movie have you picked, Rudy? Uh, honestly, uh, I'm not 100% sure I'm going to use that documentary since uh, I don't know. I might come up with something better, but if I don't, okay. So well, it's going to be okay. 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 Sure. I, I was going to say, don't let my previous statements about the documentary. <laughs> oh no! From... Oh no! I, I really don't care. I mean, I, if I could find a Street Fighter fan film that we could watch, it, <laughs> up, I would probably. That. So maybe we're going to put your decision on ice then, and it sure. will be a surprise. Sure. Okay. Cool. That's awesome. Uh, I'm sure it will be a pleasant surprise. <laughs> um, all right, so that's the podcast. Uh, it's already longer than it should have been, so let's just, I think we can just say goodbye now. You want to say goodbye, guys? Goodbye. See you guys next yeah. time. Right. Maybe. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> I have to keep it mysterious, though. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Joss Whedon did nothing wrong. Oh. <laughs> God damn it! <laughs> okay.